Hi there, my name is Ken Mayer and I'll be your instructor for, throughout this course. Now, I've been working in this uh, high-tech industry since the uh, very early 80s. Back in the days before we talked about having Windows, when everything was command line, uh, working in a variety of different mainframe environments, moving into Unix systems, uh, eventually into the uh, desktop and the servers that we see in our enterprise today. I've worked with uh, a lot of different network operating systems such as the Novell environment and of course then along came uh, what we see today with the Windows environment. I remember moving uh, from the Novell to the Windows NT4 and uh, from that point never turning back and continuing to uh, go down the road of Windows from Windows NT through all the service packs up through Windows 2000, Server 2003 and of course now we're looking at Server 2008. Now over that time I've had a lot of opportunity to work with a lot of other network infrastructure so I became very uh, savvy with uh, the world of security, with the world of uh, networking, with understanding IP and TCP and many of those underlying aspects as well as with the technologies that have been uh, uh, coming uh, more and more prevalent like the virtualization and uh, some of the really cool things that we can do through the use of our Windows systems. So our goal here is to uh, be able to take all of that knowledge that I've worked with and to be able to uh, put that into uh, a way that works so that you understand uh, all of the things that we're going to talk about throughout this course and of course uh, give you a little more information than just technically what's in the book. The goal of this module is to talk about how to deploy Windows in the enterprise and uh, which is exactly what we're going to do. Now our focus will be on the Windows Server 2008 as far as the uh, type of operating system that we want to be able to deploy but all of these technologies we're going to talk with will also work with your workstation types of deployments which would include if you wanted to go all the way back to Windows XP uh, the Windows XP, Windows Vista and Windows 7. Now um, we're going to look at a lot of different tools that come uh, with the deployment options that are out there and a lot of different solutions so we're going to try to cover as many of those as we can and of course uh, show you some examples of how they work. Specifically though we are going to talk about the WDS service uh, which is the uh, Windows Deployment Service, uh, which is um, really an upgrade to what we had in the 2003 server, which was the RIS or the RIS server, the Remote Installation Services. So we're going to look at uh, what we can do with that. Uh, we're also going to look at the targets for our deployment of being virtual machines um, and those virtual machines focusing in the uh, Windows Server Virtualization or Hyper-V. And of course, uh, we have to have an activation infrastructure. As you know, with the recent releases of Windows, it's, um, you need to have more than the product key uh, and more than volume licensing. You still have to activate every version of Windows that you have just to verify that your uh, actual uh, product is, uh, is being used by you and that somebody hasn't hijacked your keys or your information. So all of that is going to be a part of what we cover here in the uh, deploying of Windows throughout your enterprise. We're going to take a look at how to deploy Windows in the 2008 server environment. So what we'll do is we're going to basically take a look at the uh, basics of what Windows deployment is and how Windows can be deployed. Now the deployment options have been around for decades and I know that sounds like a long time. Uh, some of you might say, well that doesn't seem long at all. Um, you know, really the technology has continued to uh, improve and to change, uh, but it has been really a, a long time in the world of IT. Uh, we're going to be taking a look at ways of deploying Windows basically to avoid using the sneaker net. Now the sneaker net, for those of you who haven't heard that term, simply means you walking from machine to machine to machine and doing a basic manual de uh, deployment of Windows. Now we could always do that and, uh, and we call that an IFM, an, um, an install from media, whether it was a USB drive or a DVD drive or whatever it was we were doing. We want to be able to find a way to add some automation in this to be able to uh, touch 100 or 200 machines in the same amount of time that it would take you to deploy one or two on the manual way. And uh, so we're going to take a look at what, the, uh, what that really means. What are the basics of the deployment and uh, how we can deploy with a lot of the different technologies that are available to us. So let's take a look at the basics of deployment by starting off with the definition of what deployment is. Well, deployment is just what it sounds like. It's taking an image, a ready-to-go uh, release of your operating system, and to be able to put it onto a target. Now, a ready-to-go is a way of saying that it's not, you know, you 
putting in a CD or a DVD and answering a bunch of questions and you know putting in the computer name and going through and waiting for the installation files and all that kind of stuff that we used to do when we did the IFM. This means that I have a set of files that I have to just copy it over to that hard drive and once I get a copy to that hard drive and I turn that thing on it says hey look I'm Windows and I'm ready to go. That's what we want. We're going to see that installation of the uh, of the Windows operating system and be able to do that to more than one destination at a time. Now, how you do the deployment, we have some solutions. You might be putting it onto a bare metal machine, which is what most of us tend to do. Uh, by bare metal, what we mean is whether there was an existing operating system there or not, we're going to wipe it out and put the new one in its place. Uh, so, you know, call it as you would. Bare metal typically meant there was no previous operating system, but we're not talking about uh, mig or I shouldn't say uh, migrating, but uh, upgrading an existing platform. Now that is a solution, but that's a little outside of the scope of where we're going to go here. We're talking about putting out the new solutions. Now, having said that, some of you may say, well, you know, I've got a lot of user uh, settings that they want to keep from the old version to whatever this new thing you're going to do, which is very typical in the workstation deployment. And you're going to see tools out there like the user state migration tool to be able to help you uh, make that migration work for, for you without having to do an upgrade, but being able to do that clean, to, uh, clean installation. Now, as far as doing these types of deployments, there are a lot of levels of automation. Well, maybe not a lot, but there's at least three that we're going to look at. Uh, that is, of course, the manual deployment that I've talked about. Uh, but, but by the way, the manual deployment doesn't mean that you're starting from scratch. Starting from scratch is the install from media. Uh, this means that you have the image and you're going to go and touch the machine and uh, have it connect and get the image and basically boot up. It's still a much faster process than installing it from the original media, uh, but it is uh, the slowest way we can do the automation. There's also a light touch and a zero touch, and we'll look at both of those solutions. Um, the difference between light touch and zero touch comes with uh, how much, if any, user interaction needs to be uh, made with each of the targets that I'm deploying Windows onto. Now, another part of what we have to look at, and at least I think you should look at it very briefly, are the phases that we go through to actually get to the point where we're choosing an automate or a deployment option. Um, that is the planning phase, the building phase, the deployment phase. Uh, it's one thing for me to sit here and tell you about all these great tools and say, you know, you know have fun and, and deploy, but you really want to uh, look at your enterprise uh, more in a way of a planning, you know, to say, well, what can be upgraded? What should be upgraded? Uh, can we take advantage of virtualization? Can we consolidate some things uh, that were on many different pl actual hardware platforms into a single server? Uh, talking about the building phase, building the actual image, and what do I want as a, as a solution? And then from that point, now, how do we deploy that? Should we roll it out in different areas? Should we upgrade this server first? You know, all of these things I think are very important pieces of the puzzle uh, to be able to really take advantage of Windows deployment and to not cause you to basically have to say, wow, this didn't work, uh, or I just caused an outage, and now i got to start this thing over again. So uh, I think those are all very important parts that I wanted to add in uh, to our discussion. So we're going to look at all of those, albeit somewhat briefly, but to make sure you have uh, the knowledge to know that, hey, this is something we should go through. Now, when we take a look at the planning phase, now, the planning phase has a lot of tools, and, and by the way, these are all Microsoft tools, and for the most part, most of them are free to download. There will be a few in there, like the System Center Configuration Manager, which uh, would have some licensing, but you can also utilize it uh, for a while as a trial version to uh, basically see if that's something that's going to work for you. All right, so what do we have? We have the Microsoft Assessment and Planning Toolkit. Now, the Assessment and Planning Toolkit is going to gather information from you and from your network to be able to figure out, um, you know, basically, do, does this hardware support perhaps this uh, upgrade to Windows 2008 or to Windows 7? I mean, is it ready for that type of uh, change? Uh, let's face it, some hardware might have been great for Windows XP, might have been a perfect Windows 2000 server, but by today's standards, it doesn't uh, quite meet the, uh, the needs we have for the um, more intense applications that are going to be running on some of these servers. So the uh, tool, the, what we call the map, um, is going to be able to help you in making that assessment and planning your deployments. You have the Microsoft Application Compatibility Toolkit. All right, well, that is, uh, I hope, 
makes a, a sense as far as a straightforward name, it's going to say, look at this application. Will what you're running right now on your 2003 server, is that going to work on 2008 server? Is it going to work with these workstations? Is it going to be compatible? You have the uh, Enterprise Learning Framework, uh, the Microsoft Deployment Toolkit. Now, by the way, the MDT is a tool that kind of has uh, uh, a stage in um, a couple of different levels, both in planning and in the uh, deployment and some other places that you can use this tool. Uh, and again, it's about, in this case, planning making the ideas of uh, as far as how I should uh, get ready to deploy things, what steps do I need to go through, what other software do I need to be able to install as far as just the bare operating system. And you know all of these tools can help us in that planning part of it. Uh, there's the Microsoft Desktop Optimization Packet uh, or pack that helps you with the asset inventory. Uh, and again, very good as far as uh, being able to know what you have available uh, what, is it going to meet the needs of what you have as far as the images you want to set out there? And you have the System Center Configuration Manager, which is a great tool, a, an upgrade to what we used to call the SMS, the Systems Management Server, that can uh, be able to help you not only in uh, managing the uh, connections to all the targets, but also to be able to set up all the steps, all the extras, uh, as far as what you want to push out to software. Uh, all of these are things that we can look at in the planning phase because the planning phase is just about that. What do I want to deploy? Where do I want to deploy it? Will it support? Will the application run on this thing? Uh, does it have the assets necessary for uh, my needs or do I need to invest in some other hardware, some other solutions? And then finally, being able to put it all together in such a way uh, with the uh, System Center Configuration Manager that when you're ready, you can literally just push a button and all of your planning, all those steps will be ready to go and to uh, get the deployment. Now, the building phase tools, that's where the MDT deployment workbench might be useful. Now, the building phase's job is just what it sounds like, creating the actual image. All right, so uh, one of the biggest tools that we used to use and still can use is the Windows Automated Installation Kit, what they call the WAIK. Now, that kit comes with a lot of cool software. For instance, it comes with the Windows PE environment, and we'll get a chance to talk about that. Uh, but Windows PE is basically a miniature operating system that installs in the memory of the uh, target machine. Now, by installing in the memory, what it does uh, is make sure that it does not change the hard drive, because the hard drive is either the target or the source of what I'm taking an image of. And so Windows PE running in memory doesn't affect that image, either a source or destination, and allows me to be able to uh, work with uh, my choices of what I want to do. Now, with the uh, next tool, this uh, Image X, which is another piece of that toolkit, and we'll talk more about this toolkit a little bit later on, but ImageX would then be a tool that I could use to actually take the copy of what's on that hard drive to create it as my image, my source for what I want to distribute, or to uh, use ImageX to take the existing image and to put it into this new location as the target. And also the user state migration tools, another great part of the building phase, especially when you're working on workstations. When you're deciding that you're going to take all the workstations that are running Windows Vista and you want to make them all Windows 7, uh, but you're going to do so maybe with a clean image installation, but you want to keep your user settings, then what you can do is prior to all this process is you go to all those existing workstations, copy those user settings with this tool USMT, and then after you've deployed the new Windows 7, you can put the uh, settings back in with the same tool. So again, uh, the building phase. Now, I just threw out a bunch of tools. Remember, the idea of the building phase is to come up with that perfect image that you want to use to be able to send it out um, to all the different targets. Now, the sending out of the image, that's the deployment phase. So we built it in the previous phase. Now we're getting ready to send it out. Now, there are a few things we can use. Number one, the MDT deployment workbench. Now, the workbench can help us in setting up all the tasks of what we want to install. Because remember, an image might be more than just the base operating system. We might also need to have Office, uh, you know, Word or Excel or those types of programs also installed or some of the third-party uh, application or whatever it is we need to have done after the main operating system has been put in there. Now, we also have to have a way of being able to get that operating system out to everybody. I have talked about the install for media because we could do that. We could take an image that we made in the building phase, burn it onto a DVD or load it into a USB stick, uh, pop that into the target. We could make the installation that way. 
or we could add a little more automation where we could just walk up to the uh, target, uh, have it load to what we call a pixie environment, um, uh, the pre-execution environment, and uh, be able to get a copy of Windows PE and to communicate with a server called the WDS, Windows Deployment Services, and to be able to pull an image off the uh, network. Or we can use something like System Center Configuration Manager to make all that happen under uh, auto, uh, automation where it can say, all right, you know, I need this machine to boot up and I need it to run this Windows PE and to go pull off this automation, uh, this uh, image file and install it automatically without me even touching the thing and uh, following all the steps that we made in our deployment workbench. And then, of course, adding, if it's a workstation type of uh, deployment, adding the uh, information about the user state migration tool gathered from uh, the operating system that was there before. All right, so again, a lot of cool stuff we can do uh, as far as uh, getting ready to go from, um, you know, the old days of touching each machine and booting it up from uh, DVD manually, or I remember the days of even doing it from, uh, uh, the, we called them floppy disks, you know, the, the uh, five and a quarter and the three and a half, and just plugging those things in there and uh, having like 20, I remember, I think, for Windows, uh, um, 95 to be able to do an installation the hard way. So uh, this is a lot easier, a lot faster, and uh, much more consistent. Anyway, so lots of tools, lots of phases that you should go through uh, before you just decide to turn stuff on and start throwing out images. Now let's talk a little bit about some of the basics of the Windows deployment. Now some of the common components that you're going to be familiar with um, when it comes to a deployment solution will come from the Windows Automated Installation Kit. Now, I mentioned a couple of these already, and now I'll get a chance to talk a little bit more about them. But we have the Windows PE, which is, a, a, like I said, a little miniature operating system that uh, loads up in the memory of the target uh, for the purpose of being able to uh, work with the hard drive. I mean, we're going to eventually, uh, you know, boot this thing up to Windows PE because we either want to deploy an image to this target or this target may have been the source of our image that we want to use to deploy to the rest of the world. Uh, in any event, we don't want to be using the hard drive uh, for either of those purposes because it's either the target or the source, so we have to run in the RAM environment. Now, the image X is a tool that we would then use to be able to uh, do one of those two things. Gather the information from the hard drive to make this the source of my image, or to take an existing image, uh, whether a network located or on a WDS server or just even off of a USB drive that I stuck into this PC and install that image. Now there's also the Windows System Image Manager, the uh, Windows SIM. Now SIM is an important piece of this puzzle because part of automation means I don't want to be involved in answering questions. But questions do have to be answered. What's the name of the computer going to be? What's the initial password? What domain is it a part of automatically? What kind of network information should it have? Static IP, DHCP server? You know, all of these are questions that are needed by Windows just to be able to operate. So uh, the Windows System Image Manager can help us by helping answer those questions and creating an answer file so that when you do deploy the image uh, and this thing boots up, it can just go right from that file and answer its own questions, again, leaving you out of the mix as far as having to actually interact with the uh, image deployment. And another piece of this puzzle we need is called SysPrep. SysPrep has been around for a very long time, at least since Windows 2000, as I last or first remember hearing about it. And SysPrep, short for System Preparation, was designed to remove uh, the pertinent information that makes every single workstation and server unique or uniquely identified within your network. Uh, it's a tool that we use to basically uh, create an, um, what we call an amnesiac out of Windows so it doesn't know who it is until it gets that answer file. Uh, that way we don't cause uh, any duplication of identities when we start deploying these images. And again, we'll look at each of these, uh, especially uh, the Windows PE and SysPrep uh, in a little more detail. Well, let's take a little bit more of a look at Windows PE, which stands for the Pre-Installation Environment. Now, it is a bootable version of Windows, but it does not need to be installed on the hard drive. Now, I know that sounds odd, but think about it. We did this many times. We used to, in the old days, uh, boot up a system to DOS. You know, we had a little floppy drive. We plugged it into the A drive, 
turn the machine on and it booted up to a DOS disk and then we could format the drive and do all sorts of cool stuff. Even if we wanted to in some of the old days, uh, be able to have enough information on that bootable DOS to be able to uh, talk to the network and pull down an image. I mean, we, we had those technologies, not as graceful as they are today or as uh, flexible uh, as we have them today, but we had those types of options before. But that doesn't mean that it's a bad idea. So this is a bootable version of Windows. It's not on the hard drive. As I said, it's stored in the memory. And, uh, and from there, we have an operating system that lets us interact with that, with that target. We can then say, okay, look, now I want to do something. I want to use the DVD drive to uh, maybe burn an image to or take an image and install it or USB drive or connect to the network from some location. Uh, it allows me to be able to basically say, we're doing something with imaging technology. Now, once you're booted up to the Windows PE, it's at that point that you can take an image, as I said, or install an image, but you do need some other tools to do that. Windows PE is kind of the platform that you use to be able to work with the other tools, a part of the WAIK, as I said before. One of those tools is the image X. Now again, that's part of the WAIK. It is a command line tool and it allows us to capture or to modify or to apply a WIM images. All right, now WIM, we'll talk about the WIM files in just a bit, but those are Windows image files. So the IM for image. Um, what it does is, I guess, pretty straightforward. Uh, to capture an image says, let's take a look at this hard drive, this operating system that's on here. Not the Windows PE that's in memory, but what's on the actual hard drive. And let's take a, a copy of that and save that copy somewhere in this WIM image format. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that WIM image format uh, in just a bit so that when I talk about modifying these, it'll make more sense, um, hopefully in a, in a few more pages. But anyway, we, that's one option. Now, uh, applying a WIM image, that means that somewhere else we had what I like to call the pristine environment. Pristine Environment says, I did the perfect setup of Windows, Windows 7, Windows 2008 server. I mean, it's, it's perfect, no errors, everything boots up just fine, and now I'm going to copy it. So I can deploy that thing out to a virtualization solution or out to another uh, hardware platform so I can have Windows 2008 or Windows uh, 7 or whatever I want to do. Uh, so I can then you know, use this tool to make that copy off of that perfect environment. The modify... Now this is interesting. That means that I may have, uh, let's say, captured an image, this perfect image, and I said, you know, I need to add something to it. Uh, you, know, you know, whatever I need to modify, I want to be able to alter this file without having to rebuild Windows. I don't want to rebuild it for one little change when I can just uh, use this command line tool to do what they call mounting uh, the WIM file and uh, basically making the changes in the WIM file uh, saving those changes and then being able to ch deploy whatever, to, whatever it was that I just modified. And, and we'll see uh, hopefully some examples, at least uh, in my conversation with you, about how all that process can work together. Okay, uh, again, ImageX is a tool, it's a command line tool. Now, does it have to run from Windows PE? Answer is no. But most often it's uh, more successful for us to boot up to the Windows PE and then run ImageX. Remember, ImageX is not a GUI, it is a command line tool. Another part of that Windows um, installation kit, the WAIK, is the Windows SIM. Now remember the idea was is it helps us create an unintended answer file. Uh, basically, I guess we call them the setup answer files. Now we've always had the uh, opportunity at least from Windows 2000. Uh, even with Windows NT, I remember having some answer files before, but they were text files. And in fact, they were not very graceful text files. A lot of the times we had to know the exact name of the category that we were about to uh, set up, and we would put the name of the category like networking uh, in, uh, inside of these big uh, square brackets in our WordPad or Notepad. And then we had to uh, you know, basically uh, know the variable name equals and then put in the name of the uh, answer. You know? So uh, if you knew the name of the domain, you'd say domain equals and then the quotes 
quotes around the domain and and you had to you had to use the variables you had to spell them exactly the way that they were expected to be used. Um, it, you know, it was, uh, it, I mean, it was, don't get me wrong, it was better than nothing. It was better than having to sit there and answer those questions one at a time. Because in those days, uh, when we installed Windows NT or Windows 2000, um, it wasn't uh, turn it on, boot it up, copy the files over, you know, answer some questions on one page and walk away. You, you couldn't do that. It, it would ask you some questions, do some work, ask some questions, do some work. And so you had to basically devote a few hours of your life sitting there waiting for those uh, questions to come up. At least with 2008 server, they made the installation now uh, when going for media where you do answer all the questions up front and then you can walk away and come back. But even still, we want to not have to be there. We basically want to push these images out, have them get these answer files and be able to do their own work. And just next time we see it, it's up and running. All right, so a couple other things. Uh, number one, uh, these new files are based in XML. Now, some of you are saying, okay, you just told me about how awful those text files were uh, because you had to know how everything was built. And you're saying XML. And, and they say, have you ever seen XML? And I say, sure, I understand that it has to be a, a very well-formed language, that it does not look nice without um, uh, any type of style sheet to improve its uh, appearance, um, that it uh, basically looks a bit complicated. Uh, once you start to get a, the understanding of XML, I don't think it's that hard to read. You get a lot, away with a lot of copy and paste. But we don't have to manually type it. We're going to have Windows Sim create the XML file for us. So all we have to do is help fill in some blanks. So in that essence, this is a lot easier than what I was saying we had to do with the text files. Now, granted, there was a setup manager in the old days that helped us with the uh, answer files. But setup manager, well, it was a bit different because, you know, when we use Setup Manager, it said, well, what are you installing? Windows 2000, uh, you know, uh, were you doing uh, the professional, the workstation? What are you, what are you putting in there? Um, and based on those, uh, what we said, it would have some generic questions that it would ask us. Well, in the Windows Sim, we actually have a GUI, this program, that can read the catalog files from the image and from those catalog files create a custom answer file for each specific image that we create and through those catalogs it can ask us basically all the questions we need uh, on um, this image and knowing that if you know, let's say I got two images both for server 2008 one's got IIS uh, as a part of the image and the other has uh, Hyper-V as a solution uh, they have different uh, questions that might need to be answered for the setup and Sim can read these uh, these types of uh, things, uh, the catalogs, and be able to help create that custom answer file for that particular image. So I don't have to make XML. I now have a GUI that can work with the actual image and not just the uh, you know generic uh, type of installation that allows me to be able to create that image or the answer file for that image. Now another tool that we have is SysPrep. Now SysPrep's job. Uh, is to help us in deploying Windows images. And here's how it helps. Uh, what it does is it uh, works with removing the specific identifiers, what we call the security identifiers, or identifying features out of the image prior to our deployment of the image. The, here's, here's what if you think about what happens. If I have the, uh, an image I wanted to, to deploy, well, I had to make that device in that perfect, pristine environment to be able to take an image copy of it. That meant I had to set up a Windows 7 or I had to set up a 2008 server. I had to go through and manually answer the questions, make sure everything was just as I wanted it to be, and, uh, and then make that image from it. But the problem is, is that when I created that uh, perfect environment, uh, I had to give it a host name, I had to, or a computer name. I had to tell if it was a work group or part of a domain. I had to, uh, you know, and if it was a part of a domain, it had to uh, generate um, uh, connection to the uh, domain controller, get a security identifier, and uh, all that sort of stuff that it had to go through to be able to fully set up. Because without it, I didn't have that perfect environment. But now the problem is, is I cannot take a copy of this, uh, this new deployment that I made uh, as an image and then uh, send it out around my enterprise because every destination would have the same security identifier, same host name, 
same IP address. I mean, everything would be uh, duplicated to the point that it would cause confusion on the network, contention, and services wouldn't start. And uh, there would be a tough time even being able to do things like name resolution. So SysPrep says, let's wipe out all of that information so that uh, when I do deploy, it's going to look as though it was the first time Windows has ever run. Now, if any of you have ever bought a computer uh, for home, a laptop, whatever it is, and, and you know, you're all excited, you take it out of the box, you pop that thing open, and it says, first time Windows has ever run. Okay, it's not. It was installed on the machine, uh, well, it was installed somewhere, uh, and an image was made of it, and it was put onto your laptop or onto your workstation. And so when you opened it up, put it together out of the box, uh, powered the thing on, it uh, said, hey, this is the first time Windows has ever run. Okay, well, again, it, not quite true. It, it has what I called amnesia. SysPrep uh, told it to forget everything it knew about itself. So now when you first boot it up, it's going to ask you, what's my host name? Am I part of a domain? And all of these different uh, types of uh, questions so that it can start up. But it's a very fast startup because uh, all the work of installing the operating system was already done. All you had to do is get through those other little bits of answers. And by the way, SIM can help you create the answer file to answer those sysprep erased uh, areas when you do the deployment of your new image. All right, so we talked a little bit about the WIM, the Windows Imaging Format or the uh, Windows Image Files. And I've heard it uh, described both ways, but I suppose this is a better acronym, Windows Imaging Format. It is a file-based, not sector-based image. And so let me describe what's going on. So here you see this WIM, a set of files, versus the actual hard drive that we actually pulled the image from. Now, I'm going to try to draw a little bit uh, of an inside view of what's happening inside the hard drive. If you remember, a hard drive is divided into lots of these little pie-shaped uh, pieces and uh, they go along with all these little rings and they call them sectors. And, and so, you know, we have these little sectors and these little sectors uh, are able to store all these ones and zeros all the way across. Because that's what it does. It's a hard drive. It stores ones and zeros and all that sort of stuff. And we take that sector and, uh, and we have uh, a bunch of them we put together to uh, call basically a uh, cluster of information. And so we have all these little sectors, and uh, I didn't put quite enough on there. But uh, eventually it becomes what we call the smallest um, uh, storage area that Windows can access. And uh, here's the idea. It, it can store, uh, I, I think by the time we get it all done, uh, 1,024 uh, bytes or 1K per uh, each of these little clusters. And uh, I've got a file now. And uh, my file is a notepad file. And uh, all we typed was uh, hello world on my notepad file. So it's uh, 11 bytes total in size. Uh, I think if I counted that up. And so we store it, and that little file takes up this much room right there. There's my 11 bytes right there uh, that I just used, or not bits, bytes. And, um, and now the rest of this is what we call slack space. This is probably more than you want to know about hard drives. Slack space because it can't be used for anything. It's, uh, it, it, it once, uh, once your Windows uh, NTFS system has said this sector has a file, uh, even though it's only 11 uh, bytes in size, if you actually uh, were to right-click that file in, uh, in your Windows Explorer and look at the properties, it would tell you uh, what its size on disk is. Because again, Windows you know has a uh, a smallest amount of uh, storage that it will work with, so it's going to tell you it's using up a lot of room, even though it's not. Why is this important? Well, here's why it's important. Um, if this was the old sector-based technology, when I created an image, I would take all of this and uh, copy it into my image. That's uh, you know if I look at the math. That's um, 1,013 bytes I don't need. And so instead, uh, WIM would just take that little piece of that sector that I need off of all of the hard drive and give me a much smaller uh, storage. I mean, really, I wouldn't need as much storage, uh, but it gives me just truly the files that are uh, located on the hard drive rather than the sector-by-sector-based image or copy uh, of a hard drive. 
and uh, and that makes this a much more lightweight type of uh, of uh, setup as far as the image makes it a much smaller image. Now, uh, having gone through all of that, uh, here's another good part about it: is uh, because it is a file based, I can now use something like ImageX, as I said before, to go and open this up as a file. Because it is just a file, I don't have to worry about oh, if I alter the file, it's going to change. Right? If I did some alteration, it's going to change how that cluster was, uh, was being used, and I might uh, wipe out the integrity of the disk and blah, blah, blah. Uh, all those uh, uh, issues we had, they're not there now because I'm just simply editing a file. If I make the file bigger or, or smaller, it doesn't matter. It's just a file uh, because eventually we're going to take this and deploy uh, these files uh, as our image to the new target uh, hard drive. So that was one of the cool things I said that ImageX can do. It can help us uh, mount and then update or, or edit these files um, to, before we deploy them. Okay, because it's a file, these have NTFS, assuming you're storing it on an NTFS drive, permissions so that I don't have to worry about uh, just any old user being able to get their hands on these files and uh, potentially gathering things like passwords and uh, sensitive information uh, that are on there. And also, when I now go to deploy this to a new hard drive, well, here's a new hard drive, and this hard drive may already have existing data being stored on the hard drive. In the old days, a sector-by-sector -sector image, I would take this old uh, hard drive image, sector-by-sector, -sector, starting basically at sector zero through uh, whatever the end of that image is, and I would rewrite over all that data to start at sector zero to put this new information on and I would be a very destructive uh, process. Now, let me make a new hard drive. Because these are files, if there's already existing data, I have some choices. By the way, I could still format the drive before I install these things, if that's what you want to do. But because they're files, I'm just going to add them to the hard drive. And yes, you can make a WIM bootable. So you can boot up to that uh, new operating system. So it's also uh, ability to be non destructive in its deployment as well. So uh, again, that's uh, kind of a great idea to uh, make it easy for uh, storing, easy to gather, easy to change, easy to deploy, and non-destructive and still able to be secured as uh, file accesses would be uh, by NTFS uh, permissions that you put on. Uh, makes it a great idea, a great technology for the uh, use of imaging in the uh, Windows environment. Now let's take a closer look at some of the benefits of having these uh, Windows image files. And um, so that's basically saying, you know, a closer look at WIM. Number one, it's a file. Because it's a file, information we got off the, the uh, source hard drive, we did not copy uh, the type of hardware that it was on when we did the installation. In other words, these files are just files. They are not dependent on what we call the HAL, or the hardware abstraction layer. Now, the hardware abstraction layer, the reason that might be an issue is because, uh, you know, we need drivers for Windows to be able to communicate with much of the hardware. But if the platform that we are deploying Windows whatever into is compatible with that version of Windows, we shouldn't have any issues as far as uh, being able to make that deployment. In other words, if I have a machine that is Windows 7 ready, and uh, I have an image of Windows 7, that means that Windows 7 should natively be supporting that hardware abstraction. So I don't have to worry about uh, the hardware capabilities other than making sure I have the minimum processor speed needed and the minimum amount of memory and all that sort of stuff. In fact, it's even easier in a virtualized environment because uh, all I have to do is make sure that I have those files and through the virtualization and the uh, virtualized um, connectors they use for the hardware going through that layer of Hyper-V. Well, we'll talk about that later. Uh, it makes it even easier. Okay. They can still be customized with scripts or answer files because they are images. They can be, as I said, modified offline because they are simply files that can be read from, written to, uh, modified, whatever you want to look at it from, uh, saved, and, and continue to be used. Now, another great benefit of these files is that they can share common files. In other words, uh, I may, it may very well be that I have many different types of images or, or many different uh, options I want to deploy, 
but they perhaps have the same common core settings of Windows that would be a common file system. So there's no reason for me to have to say, oh, well, I've got to take this part of Windows and copy it over here because I need it with these other options. No, I don't need to do that. They can just both reference the same common file. Kind of that same modularity that uh, they used in the approach of designing Windows. I mean, one of the reasons they created those DLL files is so they could have code that was in common to many different applications without having to rewrite the same thing over and over again. Of course, I told you they were bootable. Uh, we can boot up from that disk image that's stored in a WIM file, and it's non-destructive. It doesn't erase any of the existing data on your drives. Now, when we take a look at uh, ways to deploy Windows, we talked about some levels of automation. And uh, so that's kind of what I was trying to show us here is that as your uh, automation gets higher and higher, how many uh, machines can I deploy in the same amount of time? Uh, you know, there's, I guess, a number of ways we could put it in there. But I thought, all right, well, let's look at the manual basic installation. Now, this is assuming you're still doing a Windows uh, image file, uh, that you're doing WIM and still not doing an install for media, because IFM uh, install for media, that'd be like way down here towards uh, nothing, you know, no progress. Um, but uh, that's just taking that uh, WIM file uh, from one machine to another, putting it in there answering the questions and then walking over to the next machine and, and putting that one in there as well. So you know over here uh, as best as I can we'd have that uh, walking person uh, walking from machine to machine. I guess it looks a little more uh, like a hieroglyphic, hieroglyphic now. Anyway uh, that's one option we have. Now if we go up to the light touch deployment I still need a user over here. The user's job is to be able to answer uh, the questions uh, that would probably be there after having done sysprep. Remember I said sysprep's job is to uh, erase the uh, unique information uh, and so they'd have to be there to answer some of those basic questions uh, but the reason that it's called light touch is that uh, I'm not answering all the questions about a Windows deployment like I might have to do all the way back here with a manual or basic especially if doing it from media. Now, one of the nice things is uh, with this setup is, you know, as um, the uh, user that's uh, setting this up, I can, you know, turn on several PCs. I can have, you know, a bunch of these PCs uh, all get these images from the network while I'm sitting in that one location or however I want to set it up, and then I just have to touch each one to answer the basic questions. In other words, I could download all the images to every single machine and then just have to spend a few minutes with each one. So that gives me a little higher right automation along this graph which means that uh, I have less work to do with each machine so I should be able to get more uh, of these deployed in the same amount of time the zero touch means that all of the tasks post uh, and pre-installation tasks all of the uh, answer files are ready to go uh, everything is uh, pretty much uh, been pre-staged maybe the, the better term pre-staged so all I have to do now is have some sort of software or uh, something like the uh, System Center Configuration Manager uh, push uh, the images out to these machines and uh, these machines will all just boot up on themselves. I'm not even going to draw a user account there because I really don't have to interact with uh, these machines maybe any more than just to uh, uh, make sure that they're actually plugged in and turned on uh, which means that it's at a high level of automation going down here to the uh, level of automation and I uh, can get that much more done in fact a lot of these can be done while I'm at home relaxing come in the next morning look at the log to see if there were any problems with any of the installations so uh, lots of capabilities now all of these solutions can be done um, with uh, the existing uh, Microsoft solutions that are available to us uh, we can use WDS uh, for both of these which is um, a part of the Windows Server 2008. It's just a role that we'll talk about a little bit later that you can install to set this up. And again, a few other pieces of uh, software, uh, you know, software to make the images, software to create the answer files, those types of things, uh, all available for us uh, to be able to set up uh, any level of deployment or automation uh, for the deployment. And it should be a matter of uh, your having gone through the planning phase to determine what was the best way uh, for you to be able to deploy Windows. Now as we talk about these levels of automation, the first one I mentioned was manual deployment. Now I try to make it sound pretty ugly. Um, and it's really not ugly, it works very well. 
uh, works almost every single time. You boot from a DVD, USB drive uh, is very popular today. Network shares uh, as well works out just fine for us. Uh, and you can still have answer files made available so that uh, once you get the image uh, set up, that you could uh, you know, tell it, you know, do this uh, setup, use this answer file, and then kind of walk away from it. Now, in this process, if you boot from the DVD that we'll start off with, um, you would still need to have some way of booting up to uh, be able to uh, get to the DVD. In other words, powering on the system. For the most part, when you do this manual deployment from a DVD drive, um, if the BIOS is already set to boot from this uh, DVD CD-ROM drive first before the hard drive, then you should see a little message that you know basically says press any key to boot from uh, the DVD. Uh, you hit that any key and then it just goes through, but you have to answer all those questions individually. Uh, if you wanted to use an answer file, you could still do this from a DVD, but you have to be booted up to another operating system so you can run the setup with the appropriate uh, switches to say, and also use this answer file. Uh, you could do that from the Windows PE environment as well. A network share. Again, I have to have something on that, uh, on that target uh, that I'm going to put the image onto to let me boot up to be able to get that network share. I could, by the way, still just boot up to my regular old Windows and uh, try to make that network share and see if I'm doing an upgrade versus a clean install. Uh, that is a possibility. Or again, booting to Windows PE and making the network connection as well. Uh, in those events, the answer files are usually in the same location. Uh, but that's still a lot of work and you got to touch each one uh, individually to be able to get this deployment out there. Now you could manually deploy as well from the WDS server. Now the WDS server uh, we'll talk about in just uh, a little more detail as we go on, uh, but that's the same as a network share uh, because it is a network device. Now for the Windows deployment services, you do have to have some underlying technologies made available to you. You need to have Active Directory made available to you, a DHCP server, a DNS server, and uh, the file system on the uh, WDS server must be in the NTFS format for the uh, security uh, portions of uh, as far as the authorization is concerned. So let me uh, see if I can kind of quickly uh, point out some of the uh, underlying what I need. So here's my uh, target machine. And my target machine is uh, the one that wants the new image on there. And let's add in this other empty space on my uh, Ethernet network, the WDS server. All right, so the target machine, now remember, we're talking about a manual deployment here uh, as opposed to um, uh, some of the levels of automation. You're going to see something very similar to this um, uh, setup where we'll talk even more about why I need these underlying technologies to uh, make WDS uh, services available to me. Uh, but for the most part, here's uh, some of the basics. Number one, uh, DNS. Uh, you know, if I'm doing a network boot, I need the DNS server to be able to tell me what is the IP address of uh, my WDS server. Without the IP address, I'm not going to get very far. Um, so that means I need to have the, D the DNS server tell me, hey, there's the WDS server. That's where your image is located. Uh, I, as a target, need my own IP address. So that's why I need a DHCP server to be able to help me assign that own IP address. And when I finally then use that information to make the connection and I'm asking for an image, well, imagine if you would that I was perhaps a, a bit of a rogue agent. Let's put a, another connection on our Ethernet segment and we'll put uh, Ken, the hacker here, try to make him look a little more evil here. Um, and I decide I'm going to plug in my machine and get a free licensed version of 2008 server to save myself a lot of money. And I uh, use your network and I connect to the WDS server to get that uh, Windows 2008. And before it sends it to me, it says, hey, who are you? Authenticate yourself. Uh, I need to know that you even have permission, uh, you or the computer that you're using to get that image and if you can't authenticate then boom I'm not giving you anything so that's why the Active Directory as well uh, to help me with the authentication process. Uh, it, it's, uh, it all works together to give us a more secure and a more dynamic uh, setup and delivery of image technologies with WDS. 
All right, so now that was a, a lot of uh, outside the uh, topic when we said, you know, hey, we're talking about manual deployment. Uh, but um, WDS is a manual deployment option. I just thought it would be uh, kind of good to at least introduce now some of these uh, underlying technologies that are needed um, for you to be able to have a WDS server, and we'll certainly talk about it in more detail. Now, some of the other deployment options that we talked about were things like the light and zero touch deployment. Now, uh, the um, Service Center Configuration Manager 2007 can support many tasks to uh, make the light touch and zero touch installations work for you. Now, what it can do is it can gather information. Remember the idea of the security or the configuration manager is it connects to these machines and can deploy agents. Now, I don't want to get into the ins and outs of the uh, configuration manager, but it can deploy software agents onto these devices to be able to gather information about the hardware inventory that you can use to create reports to determine if um, the potential target is even a good candidate. But it also then with that agent is capable between the communications between uh, the agent install on the target and the configuration manager, able to uh, do things like the distribution of the operating system to provide the necessary authorizations um, both in retrieving the information from the WDS server and on the destination location as well. It can initiate the installation of software packages and many other features that make it possible for you to set up and schedule these deployments. Now, along with that, you still need the, um, the, the Microsoft Deployment Toolkit, the MDT, uh, for the, um, uh, the needs of setting up the individual tasks that you want to have run. Uh, the WDS server, which, uh, as I already uh, talked about, is the location or storage of the image plus the uh, agent to authenticate whether or not you have the right to get that image um, and many other things that I need. And if we're saving the uh, user settings, especially useful in going from uh, one workstation type like Vista to 7, uh, we can use the USMT as well. Now, the difference between all of this, of course, light and zero touch is uh, in the zero touch, I don't need to be there to answer any questions. That's where I might have the Windows SIM having created my answer file so that uh, that can be utilized to uh, fill in the, uh, the gaps of what's missing uh, after I deploy the software and the thing boots up, gets all the answers off the answer file, and then by the time it's done, it's done. I just need to uh, look at the logs and make sure there were no errors.